why they believe the dietary laws are still in effect. Just throw me a 100 if you do. Put me a zero if you think the dietary laws are not in effect. <laughs> if you think the dietary laws are a, a thing of the past, JC died upon that cross, and we don't have to do that foolishness no more. He did it. He paid it all. Hmm. Looks like everybody threw a 100 in there. So let's go ahead and close out because y'all already got this. Y'all know what we're working with already. So we can just close out and we can just go ahead and relax and chill out on our date. What y'all laughing? What y'all putting laughing emojis for? Yeah. Man, I tell you, I love the people the most high, y'all. We are truly a peculiar people. We are a peculiar treasure. As the word says, I can't wait to spend the rest of eternity with you all in the kingdom. I really can't wait to see the smile on your face because I know your face will be a reflection of mine. When I'm looking at you smiling, <laughs> uh, you're going to be looking at me smiling. And I know that we're going to be so happy. We don't even have to say anything. We're just going to look at each other and smile. Before we get into this, I just want to make a disclaimer. I know somebody is saying, oh, here we go. Here we go. There will be some squeamish stuff shown in this presentation. If you have a squeamish mentality, a squeamish stomach, that you have this gag reflex thing, please do yourself a favor and get off of this thing right now because you don't need to be in this room. Maybe this is not for you. So if you're squeamish, please do yourself a favor and you know protect yourself because I'm going to show some things. This is what Paul, Rabbi Shaul said, brethren, my heart's desire in prayer to Elohim, to the Most High, for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, we can clearly see, and many of us already know, who was Paul talking to when he said, brethren, my heart's desire in prayer to Elohim? Was he talking to, like to people in the Baptist Church or the Catholic Church, Seventh-day Adventists, or I, I mean, the Pentecostals, all them non-denominational folks out there. I think he clearly spelled out Israel. And I think almost 10 years ago when I woke up to this truth and I asked him, I said, hey, look, where's that precept? Where's that scripture that says spiritual Israel? I probably got about four or five people out there still searching for that precept. They have not come back to me yet to tell me that, hey, this is the spiritual Israel precept. See, we were right. The church is Israel. We know for a fact, because those folks cannot show us a precept that says spiritual Israel, that there is no such thing as spiritual Israel. We can make up anything and throw it in the script if we want to believe that, but we are a peculiar people. <laughs> we are a chosen generation and we're not going to be throwing stuff in the scripts that's just not there. I could picture Paul right now. He's just praying. He's like, Heavenly Father, I need to talk to you about this because it's on my heart heavy for Christian, um, uh, for Israel, is that they might be saved. And what is he talking about, they? Who is they? Who is they? I think we can clearly see that they means Israel. It was for Israel that they might be saved. He said, for our bad on record that they have a zeal of Elohim, but not according to knowledge. And that's the problem. That is the problem with Israel today, that we have a zeal sometimes. We are 100 in this thing, but we're 100 with things that we haven't precept. We have, we have things that we believe, unfortunately, that does not align with the book because we have not studied to show ourselves approved unto Elohim, being a workman or workwoman that rightly devised the word of truth. And, and so as a result, we go around and we think things that is not straight, that is not correct. And so we, uh, we have to fix that problem. We have to have that zeal true, but 
it has to be according to knowledge and that knowledge comes from the book Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 said my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge the place where knowledge comes from y'all know y'all know it comes from the book it doesn't come from our own thoughts and uh, the opinions that we bring up in our heart and stuff like that the knowledge comes from the book from the word of the most high we have to consult the word of the most high to get that knowledge but Hosea wrote this thing from Almighty Yah and said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why? Because you have rejected knowledge. And as a result, Almighty Yah is saying, I will also reject you, that you shall be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the Torah, the law of your Elohim. Almighty Yah will also forget your children. And so as a result of rejecting knowledge, as a result of walking around talking about we spiritual Israel, you know, Paul was talking about us in all of those epistles and those 14 epistles. They ain't near a place where Paul was talking about, hey, y'all Christians, I'm praying for y'all. My prayer and my heart's desire, he said, my heart's desire. And my prayer to Elohim, to the Most High, is for Christianity. He ain't never said that narrow one time. So we cannot be injecting those things into the, the word like that. And we definitely doing ourselves a disservice by injecting those things into our own thought processes because it throws us into a place of the broad and the wide way where anything goes, where grace can fix it all. Oh, that glass is broken. Oh, grace will fix that. Man, you tripped and fell. Well, hey, grace will rewind that and that embarrassment will be gone. All of that foolishness comes as a result of a lack of knowledge. Let's get into this. Martin says, not knowing the truth doesn't make you ignorant. Not wanting to know the truth is what makes you ignorant. So ignorance is not stupidity. Ignorance means simply and plainly that you just don't know something. I'm ignorant of a lot of things in this book, but I'm studying to show myself approved unto Elohim so that I can have that knowledge, so that I can know. And so that's what we have to do. Ignorance is conquered by gaining knowledge, knowledge. As he says in the meme, not knowing the truth does not make you ignorant is not wanting to know the truth, not opening the book, always just standing on what you think and you feel and you believe in your heart. And the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit told me this and the Holy Spirit told me that, but whatever Spirit told you, whatever, is exactly opposite of what's written in this book. So it cannot be from the true Holy Spirit. Without knowledge, we are definitely going to perish. So let's get into this thing. Elohim said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree into which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Another term for meat is food. So when you see meat, just think food, because it's probably not talking about meat. Most times it's, it's probably talking about just something to eat. Just a hint. For anybody that have not figured me out yet, when I ask a question, I'm looking for a word or words that come straight out of that verse. And so what did the Most High give them for food, according to Genesis 1, 29? All right, excellent. Here we go. Verse 30, it says, and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. There again, what did the Most High give them to eat? For food. There you go, Aki. Every green herb. Every green herb. All right. And what kind of food they hadn't eaten? 
They had trees and they had herbs. Genesis 2.15, and Yahuwah Elohim took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. And Yahuwah Elohim commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. For those who may not realize it, there's a special word in that verse, and it says Elohim commanded the man. We can find out that we had rules, we had laws, we had commandments before Moses was even born. In fact, before Cain and Abel was even born, the Most High Yah was giving them some commands. So we can't go around saying that Moses gave the law and so that was done away with at the cross and all of that because there was laws, there was commands that was being handed down back in the garden. And, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, someone, but I don't believe that Chihuahua or Eve had even been taken out of Adam's side at that time. It says, Yahuwah commanded the man, the man. But what did he tell the man that he could eat? All right. That's right, Aki. Every tree, any tree in that garden. 17, it says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat is thereof, you shall surely die. Can he still eat every tree? There you go. So we can clearly see that they could eat of every tree. All those trees was good for them to eat, for Adam to eat at this point, because Eve wasn't there yet. And commandments was rolling and flowing to Adam already, because some people, they don't like rules. They don't like laws and stuff like that. So we got to do away with it. But commandments was rolling to Adam already. But we can see clearly that there was a tree call a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that the most high said don't eat that thing man i don't want you to fool with that tree because if you eat that tree you're gonna die and i'm just warning you i'm commanding you in fact don't eat from that tree we can see clearly that uh, almighty yah always made a difference between what we should eat and what we shouldn't eat since the time man was in the garden of the eden you can see that almighty yah made a difference between what man should eat and what man should not eat. Somebody throw me a 100 in the chat. If you see that Almighty Yah made a difference between what Adam, which means man, should eat versus what Adam, which means man, should not eat. So we could see that even from the beginning, Almighty Yah was telling Adam there's some things that I don't want you to eat. As the story goes, I think I read that somewhere where Adam and Chihuahua, they ate, they actually ate something they wasn't supposed to eat. What happened to them when they, I mean, I don't know what chapter that's in, maybe Genesis 3. <laughs> but what happened to them when they ate the thing that the Most High said don't eat? Can anybody? Thank you, Aki. That, just like the end of Genesis 2.17 on your screen says, you shall surely die. They begin to die. They begin to die physically. Their bodies die. As a result of something dealing with appetite, as a result of something dealing with food, they made a choice and that choice killed them. Isn't that something? And so today we got a bunch of people that's talking about, I could eat anything. I just got to pray over it. I could pray for that and I could eat that pig foot. I can eat that pig. I could eat them ham hocks. Put a little slice of bacon in my bean and give it some flavor. Man, what kind of flavor is that? Hopefully y'all getting the point. Hopefully somebody has received the point that you cannot walk around trickery yourself and lying to yourself no more about J.C. died on the cross. And so now all the laws done away with, you could eat whatever in the world you want. Because if that was true, go out there to one of them cow pastures and pick up one of them cow patties and eat that if you can eat anything you want. But we can clearly see Almighty Yah made a distinction between what is good to eat and what is not good to eat. 
and that distinction was told to man, was told man was informed of that via a commandment, via a commandment. That is the foundation of this whole message. If you don't get that, then it's okay if you want to go eat whatever you eat, because then Yahoo in France going to be following this book and we're going to walk in the kingdom smiling because we know what it says in Revelation 22, 14, that those who have kept the commandments, they're going to have right to the tree of life. This very tree of life that they forsook to eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Revelation 22, 14 said, though only those who kept the commandments are going to be able to eat from the tree of life and then be able to walk into the gates of the city. So all praise to the Most High, yeah. He told Adam that he could eat herbs and he could eat fruit from the trees. What about mushrooms? Can we eat mushrooms? Let's talk about it. Mushrooms grow from spores, not seeds. Remember that thing he said, every tree bearing seed and all of that? A mushroom grow from spores, not seeds, that are so tiny you can't see individual spores with the naked eye. In the wild, mushrooms grow on both soil and other substrates like wood. No soil is necessary for growing them at home. So you can grow mushrooms on trees and in the ground everywhere. What do y'all think? Mushrooms, thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh, I don't know. They grow from spores and those spores come out and they get planted on trees and stuff like that and in the ground. I'm really not a fan of it, but as far as mushrooms is concerned, I personally, I don't see anything biblically wrong with it. It can grow from the ground, but that's going to be a judgment call on you, what you want to do. If me personally, I choose to avoid them if possible, but that's on you. I'm not saying that eat mushrooms is a sin, so don't go there in your mind. I do hear that there's some good nutrients and vitamins and stuff like that, you know, so most high must have gave them for a purpose and a reason. I just haven't studied that purpose and reason. Yeah, that's a good point. Our key is some kind of fungus too, fungi. Yeah, and that don't sound fun. Let's talk about food from Cain and Abel to Noah. So we all know that Eve bare Cain and then she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Cain was tilling him some ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought up the fruit of the ground and offering unto Yahuwah. So we can clearly see that fruit was the fruit of the ground. It was an offering to Yahuwah. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and Yahuwah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Yahuwah, he respected that. He respected Abel for that. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect, and Cain was very wrought, and his countenance fell. So Cain was upset because his offering wasn't respected by Almighty Yah. Can somebody tell me why Cain's offering wasn't respected? It wasn't his best. It wasn't his best. That's a good answer. Anybody else? He put no thought in it. He just gave him whatever. I thought you was about to say he didn't put his foot in the offering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that's good. Somebody said his wasn't first. You want to elaborate on that? It says that Abel brought the firstlings, but okay. in, but it says Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. There's no reference to if it was first, last, second. There's nothing. It just says he brought some of his fruit. Okay. All right. 
So we're going to go to Leviticus 23. Notice that Cain in Genesis 4 and 3, he brought the fruit of the ground, but Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. Okay, notice that. I'm throwing that at you for a reason. Okay, Leviticus 23, 10. Look at that heading. Highlight your heading over there, over verse 9. The sheaf of first fruits. Notice what it says. Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall weigh the sheaf before Yahuwah to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Shabbat. The priest shall wave it. What did they have to bring to the priest? According to verse 10 and verse 11. All right. The sheaf of the first fruit. The sheaf. Okay. All right. Sheaf is Omer. Anybody ever heard that term Omer before? Omer? I tell them what an Omer is. Dry measure. It is one-tenth of an ephah. It is a dry measure. We always think in sheaf and that they bring some stalks and stuff like that. But what they had to bring was they had to bring some grain. They was bringing a dry measure of grain. That sheaf of the first fruit had to be taken to the priest. Verse 11, at the end of it, it says that the priest had to wave it. So the priest was either waving it or he was heaving it. And the heaving typically was for something that he was doing for himself for the tide. And the wave was typically something that he was doing for others or for the nation. Verse 12 says this, and you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf in he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahuwah. What did they have to offer? The first fruits. In verse 11, what did they have to offer? All right. In verse 12, what did they have to offer? Highlight that word and. And means that's something else. What else did they have to offer? All right. So somebody tell me what in total did they have to offer for first fruits as a first fruit offering? All right, I'm starting to see some right answers come across. They had to offer the Omer, but they also had to offer, in verse 12, a he lamb. Everybody on board, put me a Y for yes, an N for no. If you understand, they had to offer the sheaf and a lamb. Okay. So going back to what we were talking about in Genesis chapter 4, it says in verse 3, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Yahuwah. What did Cain do wrong? Uh, no lamb. He didn't have a he lamb. Exactly. Cain brought fruit of the ground. He brought the sheaf, but he didn't bring the lamb. And so in verse 4, it says, in Abel, he also key word, brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. He brought the fruit of the ground like Cain did, but he also, man, we got the scholars in the room today. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground only, but Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and the fat thereof. He brought what was necessary for a first fruit offering, which tells me they was doing first fruit offering before the law was given to Moses. Isn't that wonderful? If anybody get that point, put an explanation point in the chat. If you get that point that they was doing first fruit offering before Moses got them two tablets on that side of that mountain. <laughs> And they got people that says, you're not supposed to keep the Old Testament. Man, what a disservice they are doing to themselves. So we can clearly see now 
they was growing crops and they was raising animals, not just for offerings, but for food, which is our topic today. Let's see. So we're still talking about food in Noah's time. We all know about Noah and the ark and the flood and everything. And Noah, for those who may not know, I, I know there's going to be some folks that in Genesis 6, 8 says plainly and simply, Noah found grace. Yeah, grace. That thing that they see died on the cross and supposedly gave everybody, that thing was operating. Grace was operating back before the flood, before the Ten Commandment tablets was given. Noah found grace, according to Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. Genesis 7, 1. And Yahuwah said unto Noah, Come you and all your house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast, you shall take these by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. How did Noah know what was a clean beast and what was not a clean beast? Could it have been that Noah had a dietary law before the flood? I mean, how did he know? Because most high didn't say, hey, look, these are clean. You take them and these not clean, get two of them and seven of them clean ones. He said plainly and simply, like Noah already knew that clean beast was clean beast and not clean beast was not clean beast. <laughs> there had to have been some knowledge of what was clean and not clean. Even before the flood, before the Ten Commandments was given, there had to have been some idea of what clean and unclean was even back then for Noah to just say, oh, okay, I get seven of them and two of those. Of fowl, also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth for yet seven days. And I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did. If you're going to make it in the kingdom, you got to what? You got to what? Something? That's right. You got to do something. And so Noah did according to all that Yahuwah commanded him. And oh, look at that word. It says command. That was commandments even in Noah's day. That was a commandment in the Garden of Eden. That was a commandment for them to keep first fruit. And that's why Cain and Abel was bringing that first fruit. Cain, he didn't bring no animal sacrifice. See, because it's all supposed to point to Mashiach anyway, the first fruit and the lamb that was slain. But Cain, he was trying to leave out the lamb that was slain part. He, he didn't want that part. Noah in Genesis 7, 5 was commanded to, to do something and Noah did according to all that Yahuwah commanded him. Commands. In the Old Testament, before Moses received the tables, the two tables, the lovely two tables of stone on the side of the mountain, Genesis 7, 8, of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. Look at that. Still talking about clean and unclean. There went in two and two and two Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as Elohim had commanded Noah. Look at that. Most high commanded Noah, and Noah did just that. Genesis 7 9, they loved that, where there went in two and two into the ark, the male and the female, as Elohim had commanded Noah. They loved that verse because it leaves out all, all of the detail with the clean and the unclean. See, there was seven clean and two unclean. Genesis 8, 20, and Noah built an altar unto Yahuwah and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Notice that he took of clean beast and clean fowl and he offered on the altar. Here it is. There was always offerings going on. 
go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, where the Most High killed the little animals and made coats of skins for Adam and Eve. What you think? He just went ahead and threw them little animal bodies away? No, that became a burnt offering. And that's how Adam and Chihuahua learned about the offering system and the burnt offering. And Cain and Abel, they later learned about burnt offerings. And here we have Noah before the flood. He's also still carrying on the burnt offerings. In Genesis chapter 9, it says, And Elohim blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that move upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. And notice he says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you or food for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. It said every moving thing. And so they could eat pig back then too. Every, it said every moving thing. But why did uh, Most High Yah say that? Genesis 6, 19. This was pre-flood. This is what the Most High told him. He said, in every living thing of all flesh, same verbiage, two of every sort shall you bring into the ark to keep them alive with you, and they shall be male and female of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto you to keep them alive, to keep them alive. It was because the flood was coming and take you unto thee of all food that is eaten and you shall gather it to thee and it shall be for food for you and for them. So the Most High said, take unto you of all food that is eaten and you shall gather it to thee and it shall be for food for you and for them. Did Noah and the animals eat the same food on the ark? Just a why for yes and for no. All right. At the end of Genesis 6, 20, why did he say that all of these fowl and cattle and creeping things and everything shall come unto you to keep them alive? And then he tells them next, and take you unto the all of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for you and for them. So if they ate the same food there, and he's telling Noah, it's like, hey, look, they coming to you to keep them alive. What if he wouldn't have told Noah to keep them alive? They're going to come to you to keep them alive. What y'all think, Noah, <laughs> what y'all think would have happened, you know, if some like deer and stuff just popped up on Noah's doorstep one day? I'm just asking, do y'all think Noah probably would have had him some deer kebab, you know, if the Most High wouldn't have said to keep them alive? I'm just asking, uh, I'm just asking, can y'all, if y'all see what I'm talking about, put me a why in the chat. If he wouldn't have said to keep them alive, no one would have been like, man, this must be food for us to eat because it's been raining. We've been out here 150 days. It rained like 40 days, 40 nights. We're going to need something to eat. We got some grain and stuff, but we got all these animals. We got to float out here the rest of our lives. The most high I told him in Genesis 6, 20, at the end, he said to keep them alive. He specifically let him know this wasn't for you to eat. The thought and the theory out there is that they were all vegans. They were just vegetarians, just eating herbs and fruit from the trees. But I have a lot of indication that they were carnivores even back then before the flood. He told them they coming to you to keep them alive, not just to save them from the flood. But then he tells them, he follows up and he says, all the food, go gather that, and it's going to be food for you and for them. 
because I don't want you eating them. I want you to keep them alive. I got a purpose for them after the flood. If you get that point, somebody throw me a, a exclamation point in the chat. If you get the point that Noah would have had him some kebabs and stuff, he'd have been like, man, we got all this meat up in here. All right. Yeah, so he told them all the food, gather it for food for you and for them. And guess what happened in Genesis 6.22? Thus did Noah according to all that Elohim commanded him, so did he. Keyword commanded. There's another command that went forth before the Ten Commandments was given, before the law was given, and Noah was following that command. If Noah knew what was clean and what was not clean, then Noah evidently had dietary laws, right? If Noah had dietary laws, when Almighty Yah, in Genesis 9, 3, every moving thing that liveth shall be food for you, y'all think Noah went in his mind like, you know, I'm going to eat them snails and I'm going to eat that, that dog over there. I'm going to eat that pig. I'm going to eat them elephants and stuff. Do y'all think Noah actually went there in his mind? Or do you think that he went to what he had been eating the whole time? He's going to eat what he considered clean from the original instructions. Uh, I mean, if you want to eat rats and bats and pigs and, I mean, just all kind of snails and stuff like that, go on and do that. But don't be tripping up nobody else because... And you causing people to fall by the wayside as a result. The blind lead the blind. And it's really is the only way they're going to fall for that is because it's already in their heart that they want to do that foolishness anyway. I mean, just go on and do that if you're going to do that. That's my take on it. That's my take. But this lesson is for those who want to know truth and want to do that. What do y'all think? Before the flood, were they all vegans or did they eat meat? Okay, so uh, the question is vegan only. I think, you know, Malachi 3, 6, it says, I'm Yahuwah, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. He, he changed not. So I think from the beginning that he had one set of laws or commands, and that came from Adam in the garden on down to today, and he didn't change. For I am Yahuwah, I change not, therefore you sons of Yahuwah are not consumed. He's not going to change. Because he doesn't change, in Deuteronomy chapter 14, he said, you shall not eat any abominable thing. He's not going to change and say, man, you could eat all those unclean stuff that I said. All those things that I said was unclean, you could eat that now. Because JC died on the cross, everything cool now. Uh, you can do whatever you want. I mean, do whatever you want now. Law's done away with. Have fun. Eat, drink, be merry. And people still dying because sin is still prevalent. But he told them, uh, Deuteronomy 14, 3, you shall not eat any abominable thing. It says, these are the beasts which you shall eat, the ox, the sheep, and the goat, etc., I just got a question. Did he intend for us to be vegan? When he said, these are the beasts which you shall eat, that lets me know that he was making a distinction there again between things they could eat and things they could not eat. If I didn't say you could eat that, then don't eat that because it don't fall in that category. Point two, if he says, these are the beasts you can eat, then I guess they weren't eating just fruit and vegetable like that. He expected them to eat some meat too. Deuteronomy 14.9 says, these you shall eat of all that are in the waters, all that have fins and scales shall you eat. You think he expected that they would eat some fish? If he says, these you shall eat, that's in the water, I think he would expect us to eat something that come out of that water. And he distinguished it by saying, fins and scales, shall you eat? Deuteronomy 14, 11, of all clean birds, you shall eat. 
y'all think he expected that we would eat some birds? I mean, I'm I'm just trying to find out. I just want to do what the book says. He expected us to eat some of the birds, and he was making statements to distinguish that. Let's break it down. Eat nothing deemed abominable. If you eat something that's abominable, you make yourself abominable to the Most High Yah. You you set yourself apart in that big pool of people called abroad in the wide way. Okay, if, if you're gonna eat something that he deemed abominable, that he said is not good to eat, clean things of the land. Deuteronomy fourteen four, which is the beast. Clean things of the water is Deuteronomy 14, verse 9, things that have fins and scales. Clean things of the air is Deuteronomy 14, verse 11, which is the birds. If you can eat beast and like it says, let me see, ox, sheep, and goat. If you can eat fish that have fins and scales, if you can eat birds, certain birds, and we'll, we'll get into that. Do y'all think they was vegans only? Speak you unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the house be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the land. When he said every man according to his eating, y'all think he meant that they was going to eat that land? I, I'm, I'm just curious. Just a why for yes or an for no. <laughs> I just want to know. I, man, I've been searching all over in this book. Y'all think he meant according to his eating that they actually had to eat a lamb i'm just trying to figure this out y'all anybody know what they was about to do what they was about to celebrate there you go there you go coat the passover lamb and they was talking about eating that thing pesach passover that's right your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it roast them up and everything but just don't eat it eat them fruits and vegetables that's all we're supposed to eat y'all fruit and vegetables and they shall eat the flesh in that night oh wait a minute that can't mean eat the flesh of the apples and the, the grapes and the berries right i mean that's he was talking about eating flesh of apples and berries and broccoli that's what he was talking about roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. There are some herbs. Damn, man, we vegan now. <laughs> with bitter herbs. Not the good tasting one, but the bitter one. And they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs and with the Puritans thereof. Y'all think in uh, Exodus 12, 9, that he was saying, eat not of it raw, that that was talking about like, don't eat like raw broccoli and spinach and cabbage and stuff like that, or sodden with water, but roast that with fire, his head with the leg, wait a minute, broccoli don't have legs, carrots and celery, they don't have no legs on that. With the Puritans, the Puritans is the, is the organs. Berries don't have no organs like that. Ah, man, it's looking like he was talking about eating some kind of meat or something. Every winter doctrine come across and folks be following that and all serious about it too, won't argue with you and have debates with you. I'm like, man, I just 
I'm just trying to do what the books say. I don't know too much. I'm I'm just a country fella from the country down here, grew up, poor folks, and we just try and make it, you know. And verse 10 says, and you shall let nothing of it remain until the next morning, and that which remain of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. Okay, let nothing of it remain until the morning. Wait a minute, you mean to tell me they was expected to eat as much of that lamb as they could before the morning? We need some, we need some pineapples and some cherries and cantaloupe and stuff on this buffet. <laughs> uh, verse 12, and thus shall you eat it uh, with your loins gird and your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahuwah's Passover. You're going to eat Yahuwah's Passover and that Passover is what? Somebody put that, what the Passover is. Thus shall you eat it. What is it? It is Yahuwah's Passover. The lamb is Yahuwah's Passover that we expected to eat. Exodus 12, 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial and you shall keep it a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generation, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. You shall keep it a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generations. Wait a minute. Y'all think Yahuwah expect us to be keeping the Passover even in our time? Yahuwah expect us to be doing Passover even in our generations? Wow. Luke 22 and 13. And they went and found as he, Mashiach, had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Look, they was doing Passover not just in Moses' time, but thousands of years later. In Mashiach's time, it was getting ready to do the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down in the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, and it's written in the red, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What did he mean by eat this Passover with you? Y'all think he was desiring to eat that lamb? I'm not doing no Passover message, so don't get that in your head. Uh, I'm not going that direction. I'm just talking about food here. That's what the message is about. What is food? And so Mashiach desired to eat the Passover before he suffered. He said, for I say unto you, I will not anymore eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of Elohim. So Mashiach evidently expected to eat something. What y'all think he was expecting to eat for Passover? He he was desiring to eat. What do y'all think that was? That's right. I'm telling you, even in Mashiach's time, he was expecting that they keep the Passover. And still, you know, generations later, he expect that from us. So what is food? Leviticus 11 to speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Do y'all think he expect that they would be eating some beasts, some meat? Do y'all think that Yahuwah was intending for us to be vegans? According to Leviticus 11, verse 2. These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts. So there's a distinction there. These beasts, you can eat these beasts, don't eat that. He's always making that distinction. Remember back in the garden, Adam, you could eat from this tree, but that tree don't, don't eat from it. It's a distinction, all the time a distinction. Noah, get some clean beasts, seven of them, seven pairs, and then two of the unclean beasts. A distinction. But today, we can eat anything because JC died on the cross. We, we could do it. I mean, the law done away with. Man, you're depriving yourself. Get you a pork chop sandwich. 
So let's talk about meat. That's some clean meat and some unclean meat. So what is food? Deuteronomy 14, 4, these are the beasts which you shall eat, the ox, the sheep, and the goat. These are the beasts you shall eat. You can eat beasts according to the commandment, the heart and the roebuck and the fallow deer and the wild goat and the pirate and the wild ox and the shamos and every beast that parted the hoof and cleaved the cleft into two claws and chewed the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. So that's clean beast. Whatsoever parted the hoof is cloven foot and chewed the cud among the beasts that you shall eat. When he say among the beasts, he's like he's making a differentiation between clean and unclean. He's separating to let you know. So whatsoever parted the hoof and is cloven footed and chewed the cud among the beasts that you shall eat. If they got a foot that looked like that, it's cloven foot among the beasts that you shall eat. All right. A giraffe has that type of foot, but it's supposed to be a protected species. So we're not supposed to eat that. But I'm telling you, times get bad. <laughs> uh, times get bad. You know, um, I, I'm going to be down at the zoo when I run out of canned goods. I don't know about y'all. Y'all get the point. Put me an exclamation point in the chat. The giraffe is a clean animal, and there's a lot of meat on that thing. Giraffe stew, giraffe kebab, fried giraffe, sautéed, smothered giraffe, giraffe smothered on top of rice, giraffe on the half shell, giraffe soup, baked giraffe, giraffe jerky, giraffe steaks, gumbo, giraffe. Man, look, things get bad. I'm going to the zoo. When my canned goods run out, I'm going to the zoo. All right, goat. So the ones in red is the ones we're more familiar with. Uh, moose, sheep, lamb, antelope, beef, buffalo, deer, elk, the good looking mouth water and stuff. So what is not food? What is not food? Look at that foot on that. Remember the other one? Look at the foot. Look at the foot on that one. The cloven foot, this is the foot of the animals you cannot eat. All right? Uh, Deuteronomy 14, 7. Nevertheless, these shall you eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the cloven hoof as the camel and the hare, the coney, which is another rabbit-looking thing. For they chew the cud, but divide not the hoof. Therefore, they are unclean to you. So the camel and the hare don't eat those things. And the swine, because it divided the hoof, yet chew it not the cud, it is unclean unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. He said concerning the swine, you shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. I, I have a question. Can you have a pig on your farm? Is it okay to have a pig on your farm? Old McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on that farm he had a pig, yes, or maybe no. Some say yes, some say no. Deuteronomy 14, 8, the swine, because it divided the hoof, yet chew it not the cud, it is unclean unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their dead carcass. The key words here, family, is shall not eat their flesh. Of course, you don't want to do that ever. He said that about other beasts, the unclean beasts and the unclean fish and the unclean birds. He said, don't eat them. But he added something extra to that pig. He said, nor touch their dead carcass. If a pig is alive, can I touch it? This is a question. I'm from the country. They got hogs, pigs out here. I, I just want to know y'all. I'm just trying to do what the books say. If the pig not dead, can I touch him? Can I pet that? Hey, Freddie, how you doing, Freddie? <laughs> yeah, he's going to die at some point. You write a coat, but he, if he's not dead today, can I touch him? Now, if he dies and he's on my farm, there is this thing they call gloves. 
and you know they made like rain suits and stuff uh, man if i gotta get that thing off my property or whatever i'm gonna be geared up because i know according to deuteronomy 14 verse 8 that i can't eat it nor can i touch their dead carcass yeah and my shovel man i'm gonna have to bleach that after i'm through dealing with that thing but a pig on your farm is okay it's okay to have pigs on your farm if they're living alive we're not going to be raising those pigs to eat them because according to Deuteronomy 14 verse 8 that's unclean to you it's unclean to you you shall not eat of their flesh there will be no cracklings no pork chops no ham hock no pork rolls no pulled pork sandwiches none of that foolishness and if your mouth is starting to water right now you're not praying enough <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> you know you, you you gotta get over that if you have that in your system you just turn the temple the ruach hakodesh into an abomination if you have that sitting in your house in your refrigerator your freezer you are abominating your refrigerator and your freezer and possibly your whole house i'm just saying uh, don't get mad with me they always got mad with the messengers and try to kill them uh, don't kill me please please don't kill me go eat your pork do your thing but you cannot have pig to eat. Do not raise pig. Pig is, is a garbage disposal. Pigs will get rid of waste. But when it comes down to anything else, you cannot fool with that pig. I was raised, we had about six hogs when I was a little boy. Like I said, I was raised in the country. I had to feed those hogs every day. That was my job. We had one pig called Judy. And Judy was my pet. And the day they slaughtered Judy, I was like, man, that's the most high did me a favor because that's when I started like this thing against pork. Now, he was putting that in me even back then. But I'm telling you what the word says. The word says it's unclean to you. Don't eat their flesh nor touch the dead carcass. And we're going to do that thing. So remember, I said, if you're squeamish, eject yourself. Sure. I reached to my leg, I pulled on something, and it came out. Retired Army Specialist Hartman spends most of his time staying fit. I put on my favorite pants, and um, I noticed that my belt was a little um, loose. I was glad to see that the weight was going down. I, I thought for sure that it was probably was exercise, you know, normal weight loss. A few weeks later, his wife Pat are finishing up dinner when Hartville is hit with an uneasy feeling in his stomach. I felt a left side on my um, stomach. It felt as if I had needles. Maybe some needles were pinching me. I've had stomach aches, but the stomach ache is much different than what I was feeling. Hartville decides to start a body cleanse designed to rid the body of harmful toxins. Art Will is about to rid his body of more than just toxins. I'm feeling gassy. I thought at one point I had sawed myself. But when he's halfway to the bathroom, he has a very disturbing <laughs> sensation. I feel something um, slapping against my thigh. And I stopped. I reached underneath and felt something hanging. It was something I never felt before. As I'm pulling on it, I push my pajamas down further. I reached between my leg, I pulled on something, and it came out. It was moving. I cut on the lights, and I have this worm in my hand. I felt very uncomfortable knowing that there was a worm that long inside of me. The first thing that comes to my mind is how many more do I have in me? <laughs> question, uh, Ms. Ricard. <laughs> question, family. What y'all think that brother ate that produced the worm inside of him? Y'all think he, I mean, was eating something clean, unclean? Uh, yeah. 
he was evidently eating something that most high y'all said don't eat. Uh, Leviticus 11.4 says, Nevertheless, these shall you not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof as the camel, because he chewed the cud, but divide not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. And the coney, which is like a rabbit, uh, because he chewed the cud, but divided not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he chewed the cud, but divided not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, the number one problem for most folks out there, the pig, though he divide the hoof and be cloven footed, yet he chew it, not the cud. He is unclean to you. Of their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcass you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. You're not supposed to eat them. Most high y'all say don't eat that. Don't eat that. So some unclean meat out there. Monkeys and bears, lions, tigers, leopards, camels, horses, donkeys, mules, kangaroo, wallaby, uh, kangaroo. Somebody gave us some, uh, what was it, oxtail at, at one of the feasts. And man, it was good. I had never had oxtail before, but somebody came back and said, be careful the oxtail because they're starting to substitute kangaroo tail for oxtails now. And you know, oxtail is supposed to be like that big. I mean, that big. And you got something like this big. Uh, you know, that's probably old joy from the outback. You know, and he and the rat family. So you don't want to be consuming kangaroo. So be careful because they're doing a lot of switch up out there. So wallaby, possum, gophers, wombat, beavers, moles, uh, rock hydrax, weasel, ferrets, mice, rats, squirrels. Anybody ever ate squirrel before? Rabbits. Anybody ate rabbit before? Dogs and cats. Now, I know they do a lot of that in other countries. A uh, pig, I have eaten pig. Like I said, we, we used to raise pigs when I was a little boy, and I was the caretaker. I was the pig shepherd boy, like David. Uh, but it's something about that hog, I mean, that just don't look appealing. Uh, that's just me. If you're squeamish, look away a couple of years. This is a surgery of somebody that had a worm stuck in him like the last video. Yeah, yeah, before This is a person that had trichinosis worm in them, and that's what it looks like. And they uh, they don't die; they multiply. They like babies, kids. 
and that's what you're getting if you eat pork. There's a lot of videos out there with people like taking pork chops and soaking it in Coca-Cola. That seems to run the worms out of it in part, but um, I'm just saying, do you really want to eat stuff like that? Let's talk a moment about pork, ham, bacon, pepperoni. These are some of the things that the scripture tells us we should not eat. The ushers have already locked the doors. And of course, this has to do with anything that comes from a pig, a hog, a swine. And I know some of you love pork chops. You love ham and cheese sandwiches. I grew up on all that. I love bacon. But for our health's sake, we have to be willing to make some changes. God knows what's best for us. And back in the Bible days, the pig was considered unclean. It was never considered a source of food. And one of the main reasons why was the pig would eat anything. A pig eats waste and garbage. This is kind of gross, but a pig will eat its own dead child. A pig will eat other sick and infected animals. They're scavengers. And what's interesting is the pig has one of the quickest and poorest digestive systems of any animal. It takes only four hours, and that's not good. Because the digestive system is so quick and so poor, many times the toxins from the food are not properly eliminated, and they are stored in the pig's fat. That means that pig can eat all kinds of filth and garbage. It can eat other infection. Four hours later, it gets sent to the slaughter and butcher. In a few days, it's on your plate at home. You're having ribs. The problem is the toxins were never properly eliminated from the pig. On the other hand, the animals that God says are okay for us to eat, like cow, lamb, deer, buffalo, these animals eat fresh, clean vegetation. Their digestive system is much more sophisticated. In fact, a cow basically has three stomachs. And that fresh, clean vegetation is processed through a digestive system that takes 24 hours. Think about it. 24 hours versus four hours. Would you rather eat an animal that's waste and filth or an animal that eats fresh, clean vegetation? An animal that poorly processes the food and stores the toxins in its fat or an animal that properly eliminates the toxin from its body? I don't know about you, but I don't want to take a chance of putting that kind of junk in my body. And as I said, I love bacon, but a few years ago, we switched over and started eating turkey bacon. I can't tell the difference now. I love, love pizza, but I don't eat pepperoni anymore. I made changes, not only for my health's sake, I made changes to honor God. And I believe that if I'll do what I can to take care of myself, God will do what I can. I made changes also to honor the Most High, yeah like keeping the book but uh, Mr. Cobb you know I'm surprised that this guy is saying that he's telling them to keep the dietary law now he's telling them so that they can feel good in their body and stuff like that and all that not so that they can really please the most high yeah but he's telling them that so that they can feel better in their bodies this guy he's even spouting out truth concerning the hog. If a person that has an addiction to pig like that, man, you got a serious problem. You got a serious problem. Uh, what was Mashiach's view of the pig, of the swine? And remember that story in Luke chapter 8, and it's also in Mark 5, where it talks about this guy in the Gadarenes who had this thing called Legion. In verse 27, it says, and he went forth to the land, and there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house but in tombs. That dude was hanging out in the tombs, in the graveyard. When he saw Yahusha, he cried out and fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Yahusha, you son of Elohim most high. I beseech thee, torment me not. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and with feathers, and he break the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Yahusha asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, 
man, if somebody tell you their name Legion, <laughs> you either start praying or start running. And, but when he said Legion, and he said Legion because many devils were entered into him. Like I said, this story is also found in Matthew 8 and Mark 5. As the story goes in Luke 8, 31, and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there and heard of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Those devils asked to go into the pigs. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. So they ran and they drowned. They drowned up in that water. Now, I did some research on that, and I found out, unlike in my past views, that that cliff was over there, and they just ran down that steep place right over there. That place, geographically speaking, in the Gatherings in Israel, it was several miles, I want to say about three miles away. So those hogs, when the devils entered them, they had a long sprint. Those hogs, they had a long way to travel. They had a long way to go to get to that steep place where they jumped in the lake and were choked. When they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done and came to Yahushua and found a man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Yahushua, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Y'all think Mashiach perspective of swine was positive or negative? Besides this incident where he told the devil to go into the hogs and all that, didn't he say something like, don't cast your pearls to swine? Anybody remember that? Didn't he say something like, don't cast your pearls to swine? Is that like something positive reflecting the pig or negative? I think y'all right. It's pretty negative, pretty negative. Let's talk about it for a minute. Pig byproducts. Do y'all know that that's hog and just about everything out there? They have put pig in a bunch of stuff to try and abominate us. Pig can be used in up to 185 products. That was probably back in that day. Calcium from the bones is used to fortify yogurt. Anybody love yogurt? Like to eat yogurt? You might be eating pig. You better check that label carefully. The pig's nose and ears are used for dog treats. And so if you're giving your dog some treats, hey, maybe you might ought to wear some gloves or give him some other type of treat because you're not supposed to touch the dead carcass of a pig, according to Leviticus 11.7. Pig fat is used to make automobile paint. Isn't that something? I'm glad they put a clear coat on that thing so you don't have to touch the paint. Bone ash goes into train brakes. Okay, those who work in the railroad, don't touch the brakes with your hand. Bone meal goes into the coating for aluminum molds. Interesting. Gelatin from pig skin and bones helps distribute powder to bullets. What? Gelatin. So what else is uh, made with pig in it? Crayon. Anybody ever heard of crayon? Porcelain. Ice cream, soaps, insulation, floor wax, photo paper, cosmetics, whipped cream, glycerin, rubber, chalk, heart valves, conditioner, paint, water filters, antifreeze, adhesives, chewing gum. Next time you smack it on some gum, think about it. Biodiesel, shampoo, suede for shoes, plastics, and fertilizer. I even was reading one day and researching because I wanted to buy me a buy one of these uh, books with the word in it, they had imitation leather that was made from pigs. Can you imagine how wicked a person got to be where they're going to wrap your Bible in pig? The word, they're going to wrap that word that says don't fool with that pig in pig. So uh, you got to make sure you're getting the right thing. What else contains pig in it? You can unmute and say it if you want. Let's see. I see gummy bears and Dorito. You know what? 
they got me with the gummy bears. I was probably a year into not eating pork, being proud of myself. I was keeping the dietary laws. And then somebody said, man, you know that gummy bear you eat? That's got pork. And I was like, oh, no, are you kidding me? Gummy bears has it. Doritos, let's see. Uh, it says not all Doritos. That's correct. It's not all of them. Certain Doritos, I forget which ones have it. Gel caps for vitamins and supplements, that's definitely, yeah, you got to be careful of that. We had like a brand new bottle in the uh, medicine cabinet. We had to throw that stuff away. Those gel caps, especially the, the liquid ones, that's made out of pork. What they do is they char the bones and they smash it into powder and then they make that powder into those clear capsules for pills and medicines. Mentos, wow, I didn't know that. Some cheeses and breads, mm, no doubt. Hot dogs, of course, hot dogs and sausage case. And definitely, if you're getting some kind of beef hot dog, ask them what's the casing made of. And some of them, they say, well, it doesn't have a casing, but it had a casing when it went through processing. And that casing was probably pig. So do the research. Some uh, sub sandwiches and hoagies, Lipstick and makeup, that's right. Cosmetics is a big offender. Be very careful with your uh, cosmetics. I'm going to tell you something else. Jello is pure pork. Who would have known that something like Jello is pure pork? Marshmallows. I used to love the Rice Krispie treats and all. It broke my heart when I had to stop eating that stuff. We had a coat at Seco, she brought us some uh, Rice Krispie treats and they were made with like a vegan marshmallow and they were really, really good. M&Ms have pork in it. They have gelatin in it. Footballs, if you out there throwing the football, they call that thing the pig skin for a reason. Hair brushes, they have the boar hair brushes. I was in a Walmart one time and I was about to grab a brush and now I say, don't touch that, that's pig. And I was like, that's pig? She said, yeah. And I read the thing without touching it. And sure enough, there it was. A boar's hair brush. Boar is a pig. Pop-tarts. That's right. I used to eat pop-tarts all the time. Found out pop-tarts. Got the pork in it. It's the icing on it. There's pop-tarts that don't have icing. Those don't have pork in it from my research. I think we got everything. The key to it is if it has gelatin in the ingredients, it's pig. Be careful. There's a one, it's called bovine, and another gelatin is porcine. Porcine and bovine. Bovine comes from cow, and porcine comes from pork. And if you don't know when in doubt, cut it all out. Cut it all out. The mac and cheese, okay. Craft products, yeah. So we talked about how the Most High Yah set up a difference between the good tree and the bad tree and told them, hey, eat off the good, not the bad. They messed up their lives by eating off the bad. And the same thing is occurring today, how some folks think that there's no difference. JC died on that cross and stuff. The law's done all the way with, and we don't have to worry about nothing because everything's taken care of with that thing called grace. Let them go ahead and not do the research like they're doing, but you ought to be wiser than that. You ought to be on, on your P's and Q's because you were called and you were chosen. And all you have to do is be faithful, be faithful to what this book is saying. As you saw, pig, that's a big offender. And we went through the differences. Next time we come together, I'm going to uh, go into the seafood, give you a preview of that if I can. Clean and unclean seafood. I know some of y'all mouth watering, seeing that octopus thing up there, but uh, we're going to go into the clean and unclean seafood and talk about that. And then we'll talk about some other foods too. And then we'll go into some doctrinal things too. Hope you enjoyed this lesson today and I hope you learned something from it. Hope you got something from it. We're all trying to get it right. We can do it a whole lot better if we're all working together.
podcast that you're playing.